Hello, welcome to PB Machine, Episode 3. Practical Solutions for Practical Problems. Billy Basics in the House. Please, Nintendo, for the love of God, don't sue me. I don't have a lot of money. Alright, I guess this is your shit again, Ben, so do you want to do the intro? Well, I was uh, I was listening to the Airwolf theme, but fine, if you're going to interrupt that, then uh, I guess I'll have to talk about something. Um, yeah, so practical nutrition. Um, well, where do you start with that? Simply calories. So, um, well, depends on your goal, obviously. Let's, uh, sorry to interrupt. Regardless of goal, in your opinion... What are the three most important things you can cover off as regards to nutrition? Go. Um, apart from calories. No, so sorry. Apart from goal. Oh, okay, yeah. So making sure total calories um, are appropriate for your goal. Um, making sure that the quality of the food you're eating is also uh, appropriate and. The final bit is structuring a diet that actually fits your lifestyle as well as supporting your goals. So, um, you know, if you're a shift worker, if you're, you know, always on your feet, uh, working in a hospital, these are all factors you have to take into account before you start digging in stuff like, you know, what macronutrient ratios and, uh, you know, and how much fiber you have in your diet. I, I like that because that's different. That's what I like about you at the band, you're just special. I'm special, yeah. You're very special. I'm special. You're different. Thanks. Like kind of in a little downsy kind of way, but you're real special. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, man. Oh, thanks uh, so much. Right, so like we said before we started recording this shit, we're going to talk about guys, guys and girls who want to get bigger, guys and girls who want to get smaller, and then someone who wants to do a generic sport. We're not going to go into specific sports, just a general good eating habit for that. So we'll start off with guys and girls who want to get bigger. Benny Boy. Yeah, so getting bigger is basically about uh, eating enough calories to support growth. Um, so that's eating enough calories so that you are gaining you know, muscle but not gaining too much fat. And, of course, um, it's kind of inevitable that you will gain some fat in the process, so you shouldn't really worry about that. It's just about making sure that you don't gain excessive amounts. So um, that's really quite simple. You just... Um, find out how many calories you need to get the scale moving up and you make sure that the scale doesn't move up too quickly um, and you make sure it's supporting your training and your recovery. So that's pretty straightforward. Shit, well. <laughs> yeah, we're done, yeah. So let's, we're done. let's hit the, hit the um, airwolf theme and uh, we'll wrap up there. <laughs> I mean, there's obviously... There's, you know, we, <laughs> Yeah, so within that, there are some subtleties and some more things you need to look at. Obviously, protein intake needs to be appropriate. Um, although, when you're in a calorie surplus, you don't have to eat as much protein as you would if you were dieting for fat loss. Um, having said that, some people still prefer to eat more protein or... You know, they just find that, uh, you know, having slightly higher protein than you might recommend, um, it, you know, just works for them. So, of course, there's some individual variability there. But in general, you're going to shoot for something like 1.5 to do 2 grams per kilo. That's going to be adequate for almost all, um, you know, uh, you know, training programs out there and, you know, for all individuals, um, takes into account a fairly generous, uh, sort of error margin as well. So that's probably, you know, two grams per kilo is probably more than you need, even with a little bit of, um, of error. So even with grandpa's so, cough syrup, you don't need to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then in terms of carbohydrates and fat, I mean, I, don't really believe there's a magic number for carbs and fat. Um, you know, I usually start if I'm working with clients somewhere around the gram per kilo mark for fat and then carbohydrates make up the remaining calories. But then you find people who what about respond the insulin, though? Well, the insulin, obviously, um, I try to make sure I don't eat too much of that. Otherwise, it would make me fat. Um, <laughs> Fucking insulin. But, but I find, you know, there are some people who do respond better to higher carbs, lower fat. 
um, and some people who respond better to high fat, lower carbs, and it's something you just have to play around with. And, and I just, bet you that's an adherence thing. It, yeah, it can be, you know, it, because that's one thing. If you ask your clients, you know, what what they food they tend to crave, like, do you prefer salty, fatty foods or do you prefer sweet foods? That will give you an indication already of what macronutrient ratios can be easier for them to stick to. Um, so if you put them on a low fat diet and that person is just waking up every morning thinking about bacon, they're going to have a hard I time. Love bacon. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> I really like yeah. bacon. Yeah, well, I think we all do, Mark. I think we all love <laughs> bacon, but. Um, so yeah, so so the individual aspect of it there is not just yeah, like you said, it's not just to do with performance in the gym. It's also about what you can stick to and adhere to practically based on your tastes and you know, um, as well food availability. You know, it's it's all very well talking about eating like kangaroos, you know, uh, or you know buffalo or whatever, but uh, you know, if you, oil. You know, yeah, yeah. And if you but if you're a student and you can just afford a tin tuna and maybe some olive oil, then you know that's no good. So, but that that ties into more of the sort of lifestyle stuff we mentioned at the start. Yeah, I think um, that's the key thing, really, is matching your behaviors. If, uh, for example, you're my girlfriend who like loves chocolate, you're never. She did low carb and she lost a fucking shitload. Why? Because she wasn't eating chocolate. <laughs> that's why. Because <laughs> she loves chocolate. So she was on the no chocolate diet. Yeah. So she was eating. So she went from a lot to a little. And surprisingly, she wasn't on a low carb diet. She was on a lesser chocolate diet. But she called it a low carb diet, and she got great results <laughs> within about a month. Like she, she's in good shape anyway, but she was in phenomenal shape after about a month. You know, um, it's funny because people have some weird ideas about diets. Um, just on a tangent, my my sister had a friend who uh, claimed to be on a vegan diet, and her diet consisted solely of potato smileys that you put in the oven, and I think it was some type of soya yogurt, and she didn't eat pretty much anything else uh maybe some chips from the local chip shop so yeah. so uh yeah there's that one but time so- that um, our sole listener Yusef um ate only <laughs> Haribo as his uh primary yeah. source of uh carbs and he was in great shape he was in good shape but you know insulin it's gonna get him one day <laughs> Tip insulins insulin knows where you live so. <laughs> it's gonna be so diabetic <laughs> Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, like I said at the start, calories, um, food quality and fitting around your lifestyle for me are, are more important than the specific macros. But obviously, you know, there is some subtlety there, like we talked about. Um, but assume, you know, assuming you've hit those basics or sort of requirements of adequate protein intake, making sure that carbs and fat, um, are, you know, tweak to, to your individual needs, then, um, then yeah, you know, food quality, you, you just buy the best food that you can, um, on your budget. Yeah. Uh, if you're a student, that means you know, probably a lot of rice and you get uh, yourself oatmeal. the farm foods real quick. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and the thing around your lifestyle that for me is, you know, the meal timing thing is encompassed by that because, you know, I don't believe that there's necessarily an optimal eating frequency for any one person. I think it's about naturally when you, get hungry during the day some people some people actually suit eating more frequently you know so some people might end up eating six meals a day just because it it does work for them and it suits their um their sort of natural uh eating patterns and their and their schedule but then there are other people who don't have time to do that and they might only eat um two or three meals a day so so for me it's it's about what you can fit into your lifestyle and if if that isn't working for you then you might need to look at um making adjustments but for me it's always making sure things fit into your lifestyle first before you start looking at refining you know fight like we talked about in the, the other podcast about finding the optimal diet or the optimal training program don't exist there was so, um just when you're talking about the training for size uh, one thing i think i guess left out of the equation quite a lot is actually with carbohydrate intake yeah, yeah for size. Like if you train for size you train with two things volume and intensity probably high frequency as well if you're doing it properly so if you're doing these three things, say you're doing a double workout in a day, you have a real good workout in the AM, but then you're eating low carb because you're trying to do the anabolic diet. Was but the most retarded diet of all time. <laughs> have you seen the anabolic diet? Yeah, I've, I've seen um, yeah. a few. Well, I've seen that and uh, Dan Duchesne's Body Opus diet and Ultimate Diet and all that stuff. Yeah, I did the anabolic diet for a while. I use my George Foreman grill a lot. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> off tangent. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, you don't actually appreciate it. If you, maybe you're doing double sessions, and you have a good session in the morning, and then because your muscle glycogen is completed, and you're not replenishing it orally, when you come to your PM session, you're flat as shit. Maybe you don't even make it to the gym. Maybe you have to go to bed because you're just flat because you're not intaking like the appropriate nutrients for your, the training style you're trying to do. Um, like you need like, like if there's one. Uh, macronutrient that is actually have some effect on performance it's carbohydrate it's not protein it's not fat it's carbohydrate and there, you need to have a, if you're training for performance and for size basically you're training for performance you need to have an appreciation for the effect that can have even if it's just like something like you don't even have to there's recent research not that recent but if you swill leucosate rather than drinking it you can actually get the, the glycogen or the, the glucose in your muscle, your um, muscle cells faster because it doesn't have to go through the digestive tract. I might talk bullshit. I might be talking bullshit. Um, was that not the study where you get a performance increase from just swelling uh, like right? a, Yeah, rather yeah, rather than actually ingesting, ingesting it, the glucose. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I think that's what you mean. If that's placebo, who gives a fuck? It works. Yeah. Like, so do that. <laughs> <laughs> take your, yeah, I, your look at it, spore it between your bench sets and fucking swell it and spit it out on the floor. Let's see how long you last match <laughs> I think um I think that's also um a related point there which is worth bringing up is that um you've got to look at the sort of cost benefit analysis of of various strategies. So for instance, people will say, Oh, you don't need to, you know, knock a protein shake back after you've trained, that's pro science and you know uh, you don't that's a waste of time. Just eat food, and that—that's true, of course. Um, but where is the harm in doing that? Yes, you may have paid some money for, uh, you know, some whey protein, which isn't that expensive. So, yeah. So really, you know, you're sort of covering all of your bases, and there's no real downside apart from the effort of bringing a shaker with you and some protein, which is nil, and the cost of the protein. So look at the, the potential- two strategies. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say, but the potential upside, if there yeah. was an anabolic window, would be that you would get a, a much better payoff from your workouts. Whereas if you didn't do that, then obviously is quite a high negative payoff. You can even forget about the anabolic window. Look at the two strategies, right? We both go into the gym at the same time. Ben Sprouse protein shaker with his recovery shake in it, which is, has 30 grams of carbs, 60 grams of protein, um, it's fortified with iron, whatever the fuck's in it. It's got vitamins, minerals, protein, calories, and carbohydrates. I've come into the gym with jack shit. After our workout, Ben smells his protein shake and fucks off home. I've got to go to Tesco's, Greg's, Spar, try find a sandwich that tastes nice. That the and it's, it's going to cost more than what Ben spent. Ben's maybe spent thirty p per serving, forty p per serving. Like you might say it's bro science, but. His, his is more convenient. He's getting an appropriate amount of nutrients. He's getting good quality protein. Like, and he, he can get on with his day. Whereas I've got to fuck around trying to find a shop or I've got to like buy a sandwich, refrigerate the sandwich, bring the sandwich in or I've got to make a fucking salad in a bowl or uh, like, a, and you know, <laughs> like one requires a little bit of pre-thought and it's bro science or whatever, but might actually be a better strategy if you think about it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so there's no real, there's no real cost to doing it, um, compared to the potential, um, payoff. So for me, it's sort of, it, it's a sensible thing to do. Um, mm-hmm. so yeah, so there's that as well. Um, and we were talking about obviously, um, gaining muscle. And I think if there's anything you can do to just make the whole process easier and, and make sure you're covering all of your bases, then, then why not do it? Um, and if you look at what, you know, if you look at what bodybuilders do, they do tend to eat more frequently. They typically have a protein shake after training and, you know, it, it somehow seems to work. Not that you have to follow the same sort of eight meals a day kind of plan, but there's obviously some hints there that, um, you know, perhaps eating protein, you know, in smaller servings throughout the day, um, might be a better strategy. Um, but, you know, you know, obviously there's, there's evidence to show that, it, you don't necessarily need to do that, but um, I, I think at least around four to five meals, it seems to be about right. But yeah, well, you'd be uh, looking course. at it from like an isocalorific point, which would I'm assuming the studies would have been if you ingest the same nutrients, the same calories, and split them in a different frequency, the outcome is going to be the same. 
well, either one meal, two meals, three meals, four meals, five meals, six meals, over the finite time that they've done that study, or those studies, or that men analysis, or whatever, like, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the same thing split up in different ways, but let's look at a different, uh, let's look at a different perspective. Let's say that I struggle to eat enough calories. I don't have enough uh, appetite to eat enough calories to be in a surplus. I just, I hover maintenance because I just find it physically an arduous task to actually eat enough calories. Yeah. Well, what if I eat eight meals a day? If I have a small serving of carbs, small serving of protein, like salad dressing, whatever the fuck you're eating, chances are you're going to find it a lot easier to get into a calorie surplus if you're in a disciplined regimen of eating eight times a day. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was what I had to do when I started out. I didn't have a huge appetite and I, I did follow the sort of six meals a day kind of thing because, yeah, because it was exactly that problem. I couldn't eat enough in one sitting to be able to do the sort of two, three meals a day kind of style of eating that, you know, a lot of people <clears throat> are comfortable with. And, and again, you know, like, like we talked about, it's about your lifestyle and sort of personality. And if you are the sort of person who can, who prefers to eat, you know, two or three large meals in a day, then that's great. And you should probably just stick with that. Um, but if you, like you said, if you struggle to get enough calories to grow, um, then you need to eat more frequently. Uh, and it's probably easier on your digestive system as well. Um, eating slightly smaller meals spaced out, but, um, but yeah, the, the main key, you know, the key point is actually eating enough to grow. So if you can't do that, uh, eating two, three meals and eat more. So pretty straightforward. Yeah, what works for you, but generally eat enough calories, eat enough protein, get enough sleep. I'd say probably. About yeah, it. definitely. Yeah. And, and train hard enough to actually. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a different issue entirely. Uh, yeah. Okay. So what about people who want to get smaller? Um, so I find a shrink ray works, uh, nicely for, you know, or amputating a limb, but if you're talking about, you know, just fat loss, then that's slightly more intricate. Um, so they need a calorie deficit. So you need to be eating fewer calories than you require to maintain your body weight. And that is an evolving, um, process. So it's not just going to be pick a number and then stick with it. You're going to have to make adjustments, um, well, you, you should have to make adjustments along the way. Um, so, yeah, really simple. Just... Uh... <laughs> Bonus points you can guess who this is. Getting it? Uh, it sounds familiar, but I, I can't think. Honey, I shrunk the kids. Oh, God, it is, isn't it? Yeah. I just, um, I just did that. Hey, that was good, Mark. I like it. Um, Thanks, man. We should do more of that. In fact, we should have less talking on this, just mainly. More theme song. Mainly, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's easy. You just, you know, if you've got a rough idea of what your maintenance calories are, just drop your calories under that point and see if you lose weight and just track your weight consistently enough to actually get an idea of what the trend is. Um, and again, you don't want to aim for, for, well, I say you don't want to aim for too rapid a weight loss, but having said that, if you have a specific reason for doing that, like let's say you're a competitive fighter or something, you have to make a, a weight class for some sort of a, event where you're going to be weighed in, then that's different. But for most people, you want to actually aim for sort of gen, you know, a general, um, you know, one to two pounds a week. It's gonna, it's gonna be fine. Um, I mean, I've seen recommendations, you know, like Eric Helms and a bunch of other people talk about 0.5 to one percent of total body weight, which pretty much always works out about the same, you know, one to two pounds. So it's kind of, so it's, it's a refinement that's, you know, worth yeah, looking you want at. To look at the difference between half a pound a pound and half a percent, one percent of body weight. Then I will refer you to our previous previous podcast where you can uh, listen <laughs> yeah so so you know one to two pounds a week um is pretty reasonable for most people so if you're not hitting that sort of uh range then obviously you need to drop calories low or perhaps look at your training and you know general calorie expenditure um and if you're you know hitting you know are you actually uh, 
exceeding that, then that might not be a problem because, you know, initially you're going to lose some water weight, you know, muscle glycogen and all that stuff that isn't fat. Um, so, you know, if that continues after the first couple of weeks, then you probably need to back your calories up a little bit and, and try and lose weight a little bit more gently. Um, but then again, looking at um, your actual performance in the gym and uh, making sure that that's good. If you if you're losing weight at a more rapid pace and performance in the gym is good and recovery is good and you're feeling good, then I don't necessarily see the problem. Um, so in terms of the actual macronutrients, um, obviously the 1.5 to 2 gram per kilo recommendation is still valid. However, you know, there's a lot of individual variability and some people may need more protein um, you know, in the fat loss scenario. From any protein tracer, like amino acid tracer or nitrogen balance studies, there have been some done, done on um, bodybuilders um, from the 80s, from Pulaski, did some work on that. Um, basically, the findings are if you're in a calorie deficit or you're in a lower calorie diet, you may actually require the surplus. You may actually require a higher protein intake to retain muscle mass. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you're probably looking at, you know, you could be hitting more of the high end of uh, 2.5 to 3 grams per kilo at that point. Um, you know, Eric Helms did a really good um, study on this. And so, again, that's individual. And for me, the point is more that. On a diet, you, you get hungry, um, yeah. especially if you're getting very, very lean. You will find yourself feeling hungry all the time. And at that point, it doesn't matter what a study says is optimal in terms yeah. of protein intake. You need to manage hunger. Um, so, there, you know, there are different ways of managing that. Some people choose a keto diet because that suppresses their hunger. It doesn't work for everyone. Um, and some people choose to do a very high protein and diet, and, and they tend to sacrifice more fat and keep carbohydrates and protein in there until the end so um so i personally gravitate more towards higher protein <clears throat> higher carb intake and, and drop fat um but you know again this is very individual some people don't respond that well to to low fat um some people don't respond well to low carb and you have to find out you know which one you are and and you also you have to bear in mind that if you want to get really really lean it doesn't really matter what you do. It's going to kind of suck anyway, yeah. and you're just going to have to get through it. But for most people just who just want abs, you know, any reasonable set of macros will do. You probably want to bump up protein a little bit more, especially if hunger is an issue. Um, so with my clients, for instance, if they're getting really, really hungry um, and their carbs are already quite low, I might just switch them onto a full keto diet at that point and see if that works. I might just bump up protein at that point and, and actually play around with uh, carbs and fat to see what works for them. Uh, but there's no real set in stone rule there for, for macronutrients. Yeah, I think, um, and again, like I think like a practical strategy you can use when a calorie deficit is protein shakes. For me, anyway, it's something that like, really controls my hunger really, really well. Like to the point where I forgot about it until I actually started to take a protein yesterday, because <laughs> um, I acquired some free protein from somewhere. Um, nice, that's always the best kind. <laughs> it's always the best kind. Well, I haven't taken protein shakes in must be like five years. Well, because uh, you don't want to get too big. Oh yeah, obviously. I mean, I'd, I'd just be cheating. Like, they'd be, you know, taking them, them, them protons. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a protein shake in the morning, and then I had a protein shake when I got home, and then it was pancake Tuesday, obviously. Hall of the Jesus player. Uh, I saw that man. That, that was a good <laughs> stack. It. What's your What's your pancake stack at the minute, Mark? What are you What are you running? Um, uh, I'm rocking just the uh, the traditional, you know, the the, the beginner cycle of um, one egg, 100 grams of um, flour, so non self raising flour, and um, 300 mils of full fat milk, fried in a frying pan with half a tub of butter. Sweet Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, my stack. I'm going to make some insane gains from that stack. <laughs> uh, and then uh, to add to the stack, we uh, put both three rashes of bacon and some maple syrup, rolled it up into a sandwich and ate it. Okay, I think I think you're living the, the dream right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that puts a lot of people's pancake days to shame. Um yeah, that, that, that's uh, that's pretty much my ideal. I mean, maple syrup and bacon with pancakes, that's, that's pretty much the pinnacle of human <laughs> achievement much. right there. 
and uh, for dessert, I did the exact same thing and put a banana in it. Nice. Uh, that was uh, well, because obviously you've got to try and hit your five a day, right? <laughs> so obviously, like, uh, <laughs> and, you know, bacon's one, pancakes two, yeah. butter's three, uh, bananas four, and then protein shake in the morning. That's five. What up? Awesome. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah. So that's something which is um, again kind of. Uh, look down on is the you know the idea of just having protein shakes uh, in your diet. You know, pe- obviously solid food is more satiating, but protein itself is satiating um, as well as you know the corresponding insulin spike and all of that. You know, insulin tends yeah. to block your um, hunger as well. So, so yeah, it's actually quite a good strategy for um, for maintaining hunger. But again, you know, it doesn't necessarily work for everyone. So you have uh, to kind of. From a- personal standpoint i find it a lot easier like say i don't i'm not hungry in the morning but if i have a protein shake in the morning then i'm not hungry till lunch at lunch if i have another protein shake i'm probably not gonna be hungry again for two three hours and then like i can train in that time and then i can eat but then i've got a whole lot of calories to play with and as someone who likes to eat big meals for me that's a real good way of blunting the amount of damage i can do in that meal i can just chug away a protein until it's meal time uh, that might not be uh, the, uh, the, the you know, uh, that, that backloading, the uh, car backloading. Yeah, 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 it's on that car backloading time. All right, uh, I thought that was just having protein shakes and then having a big meal. <laughs> you got to brand it somehow. Ah, uh, what about protein front loading? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, excellent. <laughs> it's gonna I like uh, I like bacon side loading. <laughs> I just like bacon loading. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just loads of bacon. You, you could have time. like a barbell with like bacon plates. And then as a drop set, you could like eat a rasher off each end after every rep. Then you're getting yeah. your protein fats in, but you're going to get a workout in, high volume. That would work. Yeah. So, so that sort of style of eating, um, sort of strategically under eating and then having a sort of feast meal in the, in the evening does work quite well for a lot of people. So again, that's one of those things where it's, you know, it's a lifestyle um, issue and, and sort of personality um, comes into play. So you know, a lot of people wouldn't be able to do that because they, they might find themselves sort of under eating if they got to the evening and yeah. had to eat a huge meal. Um, so, so yeah, but that, that illustrates a really good point, which is that, you know, there are lots of approaches that work yeah. and you just have right. to find the one that, fits your lifestyle best if you're in a calorie deficit what it, however you achieve that is a fair game yeah exactly <laughs> yeah i mean i personally i prefer like some form of cyclical diet where you have you know days where you eat a calorie surplus and days when you eat a more severe deficit and that that just suits me better than straight you know moderate kind of deficit uh eating to to achieve fat loss, but yeah, see, that wouldn't work for me. Every- oh lord, the surplus! <laughs> oh lord! <laughs> yeah, and and also you've got to take into account that that might not be appropriate for you know for clients. So, for instance, if you have a male or a female client who's had a history of disordered eating, you are not going to give them a refeed day because um, <laughs> that's a very very bad idea. Oh, um, in fact, refeed day of, uh, that's just yeah, that's a bad idea. Yeah, exactly, and um, so there's all sorts of uh, stuff there that you need to look at. Uh, but but yeah, in general, um, you know, fat loss is probably the easiest thing to set up. Um, if you're losing weight and it sucks, you're probably doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and it will suck at some point if you're doing it right. If you're doing it right, and then finally for sport, I mean, sports real simple, like, real simple. Eat food, play sport. Right, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think you should eat foods which resemble, the, yeah, you know, the, so you if you play rugby, to only eat loaves yeah. because that's the closest thing to the rugby ball you can get. If you uh, if you <laughs> play football, you should, you should eat cake, preferably a cake in the shape of a football. That could work for rugby, actually. That could, that could work pretty much any ball sport. Any, well, I think essentially any novelty cake will do the job. So it's golf. Eat cake. It's getting all yeah. Eat cake. Basically, sports nutrition summarized there. Just just eat a lot of cake. Yeah, I like on a serious though. I mean, realistically, if you play a field sport or you do any sport that involves 
running around or moving and being fit. You want to be lean. You don't want to be overly lean. You want to be, you know, like 10%, 12%, 8%, 8, 12% sort of visible abs, sort of lean, but, you know, still able to train at a decent level. So able, still able to push weights in the gym, make gains there, able to do hard conditioning and recover from it. Um, you want, you really just want like a fairly normal diet, like something like 40% carbs, 30% fat, 30% protein, probably even less protein, probably maybe 20% protein, 50% carbs, cause you are gonna need the carbs if you're a field based sport, and 30% fat, just cause, fuck it, why not? And, <laughs> pretty much, like, that's, that's the government recommendation, that's obviously based off some kind of science, I would assume, so, I would just go ahead and hang my hat on that, cause, it's there. Because, <laughs> yeah, there's, I can't see, I can't foresee any possible downsides there. <laughs> <laughs> what, the, the following 30%? Yeah, I mean, it seems totally logical, and of course, why would they make a recommendation, you know, that wasn't based on solid yeah, science? I, I assume there's a, there's a thought process behind that. I'm just, I'm just gonna do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can disagree if you want, but I think that's. <laughs> I think that's r- rational. Um, yeah, but yeah. I think um, I think with sports as well. Um, well, rugby, classic example. A lot of people just need to have more structure in their diet and actually pay attention to what they're eating in the first place. That's the very first step. Like I've seen some food diaries of rugby players, and it's just absolutely horrendous. You know, it's just like um, you know McDonald's and like bowls of cereal, and there's like really not much. Not much thought put into, you know, protein intake or macronutrient ratios at all. It's just eat, you know, and and the body fat thing is obviously is is part of that. Um, well, it's reflective of that. Yeah, but it's, yeah, exactly. Um, so I think you know you can get into a lot of subtleties there with um, stuff like repeated bouts. So you know, if rugby players have some sort of AM session, PM session, they might need to take in, um, you know, more easily. Um, assimilated uh nutrients like uh you know let's say a protein shake and maybe some carbohydrates uh in that you know if they're going to be training uh later in the day you know but the, i think all of that stuff is just refinement that uh yeah. you know okay it comes back to what we're talking about in the last podcast it, if you're eating mcdonald's and cereal what supplements you're taking are probably not really relevant yeah <laughs> exactly. you probably need to get yourself on three meals a day eating actual food Getting your five a day, getting insufficient protein, getting sufficient carbs in, getting fast in your diet from a source that isn't fucking Ronald McDonald. Uh, yeah, and then supplements are always just a tweak to to a solid underlying, yeah. you know, foundational diet. So, so yeah. Like if you're doing a weight session, you're going on to do rugby straight away. You might not have time to digest a proper meal, so maybe you buy a protein shake, have a protein bar, and like take a multivitamin or whatever you want to do. It's because it's convenient and fits it. So cre- oh, shit, man, don't be doing that. <laughs> Crazy bastard. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that pretty much covers practical solutions for practical problems in regards to nutrition. Um, if you have any questions, please send them to speedpowerperformance at gmail.com. I will get an actual email for the podcast and the website. Um, but until then, that you have a yeah, and if you have any sort of legal um, threats to make, uh, just direct those to Mark, um, yeah. especially if it's Kate Moss or, you know, people behind Airwolf and Nintendo and so on. Come on, Kate Moss. <laughs> yeah, you hear that, Nintendo? You hear that acclaim? Yeah, that's your 8-bit version of Airwolf I'm playing right now. Come at me, bro. <laughs> Podcast N6030. Right. All good. I thought it was pretty good. For saying yeah. we didn't really rehearse or you know. We ain't gonna rehearse, we just gotta do it. No, no, so I, I thought that was, you know, better than like than the previous attempts as well. Nah, that's good. It's gonna evolve, like, it'll get better as we go. Yeah, definitely. I think there was some good information there, uh, when you know, when actually playing the airwolf theme. Uh <laughs> <laughs> useful.
Right, so I suppose we're actually compile these and get these out. At least with the plus side with the um, player in the airwolf on the mic is I don't actually have to fucking do anything. I can just chop this up and I sit down. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Save, save some money effort there. <laughs> if it uh, sounds like shit, then I'll have to do something else, but I guess we'll see what it sounds like real soon. Uh, 